All right, everybody, we should be live here for our next game dev cast here on the Game Wisdom channel. I am Josh Blaser, and we have a great cast for you today. My guest tonight is the creative director over at Supergiant Games, as well as a former editor at GameSpot. He has worked on titles including Bastion, as well as the upcoming Roguelike Hades that I've been really enjoying. So please welcome to the stream tonight, Greg Kasevin. Hey, how's it going? I am doing well, I guess, all things considering what's happening yeah. right now. How are you doing? Uh, I'm I I can I can say the same uh, thankfully knock, knock on wood counting my blessings and all that um, mm -hmm. yeah still um, you know with uh, super giant is is uh, pretty small uh, it's just seven people back in our bastion days and fewer than twenty uh, still after after ten years so we're we're all pretty well accustomed to these kind of work from home arrangements so on some level it's old hat but um, mm -hmm. yeah obviously. A lot going on these days, and I'm I'm grateful for for stuff like this to 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 be able to talk about, think about in the in the middle of it all. Yeah, I've been the only small blessing has given everyone so much free time, so I'm like now swimming <laughs> in podcasts. Yeah. So I've been doing like three a week. I have three uh, planned for next week as well. We're always looking for more guests, so we're all kind of stuck inside now. <laughs> yeah, indeed. And slowly but surely, I'm going to look like the uh, Mountain Man, I think. Everyone will be able to <laughs> see because I can't get to get a haircut or anything yeah. like that. <laughs> but, I don't have that problem, <laughs> but yes. But it's great to have you on. We've been uh, talking and playing email tag for, seems like, a few years now. Yeah, it's great. maybe so. Yeah. It is great to finally have you on, and we certainly have a lot to talk about. We have about an hour, give or take, and we could probably spend it like an hour on each one of Super Giants games, or just that. <laughs> yes, exactly. That it's been my plan all along, Sharky, my uh, brilliant scheme. <laughs> but we certainly have a lot to discuss, and there's some really great things I think we're going to be discussing tonight. So. To begin with, since this is your first time on the cast, for people who don't know who you are, could you talk a little bit about your background and what is your role at Supergiant Games? Yeah, so my role at Supergiant Games is creative director, um, which doesn't necessarily mean much inherently. What I what I do there specifically is uh, is Pretty writing what I, and design what I do work, there, um, among other things. As, as mentioned, we're a pretty small team, so everybody kind of wears a lot of different hats, but when it comes to uh, the actual work I've done on our games, it's uh, stuff like building levels, uh, other aspects of, of design, and I put uh, all the words into them, work on the stories and game worlds and, and characters and all that sort of thing. So, uh, like, my main day-to-day -day focus on the last, especially our last two projects, Pyre and now Hades, has been kind of like the narrative design in particular, mm -hmm. but I, I bounce around to other uh, aspects of it as well. So it definitely... Um, you know, I get to do other stuff like <laughs> even even you know writing the patch notes for our uh, Hades <laughs> updates, all all kinds of little things like that, um, which certainly keeps things uh, interesting. And prior to that, um, I got into game development officially at the start of two thousand seven, uh, when I left uh, Gamespot. Well, I guess I should back up to that. You mentioned you, we we might talk about that some more. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to game development, I worked in the gaming press uh, for more than ten years. That was kind of my first. Mm -hmm. type of work uh, straight out of high school. So I've been working in and around game related stuff the entire time I've 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 worked uh, I've worked in any capacity pretty much. Um and I'm really grateful for, for that and being able to have seen the industry kind of from from different sides. Um so I was editor in chief at GameSpot from around kind of through the early 2000s um and in, into mid 2000s. Um, and then left in 2007 to go work at Electronic Arts. So the first game I worked on was uh, Command & Conquer 3 Tiberium Wars, the real-time strategy game. Mm -hmm. um, and I worked on a couple of other uh, RTS games at EA after that. And at EA is actually where I met uh, my colleagues who I still work with uh, today, who uh, Amir and Gavin uh, were, were designers slash uh, AI programmers uh, on the team nice. and uh, went on to found uh, Supergiant where and we're all kind of still still doing our thing together. So 
our games have their roots in in uh, military real time strategy games. Not particularly obvious, but it's definitely there. <laughs> I need to be careful because if I start talking, we start asking questions about Command Conquer. Well, that will just dominate the entire <laughs> conversation. For yeah, today. I can I can <laughs> I can talk about some Command and Conquer for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for the people watching us live, if you do have any questions for Gray about anything that we discuss, uh, feel free to leave them in the comments down there. But as you said, as I was talking about earlier, that you you're one of the few people who've kind of have you know your feet in both sides of the area or both sides of the aisle. You've been in the game journalism side and you've been in game development and. There's a lot that I kind of want to discuss with you about that. Again, being able to kind of see the industry from all around, especially over the last 10 years. I feel the last 10 years have been just a very, like, fast-paced change in terms of how game development has grown. Yeah. So, I guess the first thing I want to ask you is, like, like I was telling you before uh, we started the stream, that my audience includes a lot of students and first-time developers. As somebody who first started covering games and now designing and making them, what do you think has been kind of like the biggest misconception, I think, about getting into the game development side of things? Hmm, about getting into game development. I, I would, the first thing that mm -hmm. comes to mind uh, as far as like misconceptions about getting into game development is that there is like a way <laughs> to do it. Um, there, everybody, I think this is like, literally true. Everybody who I've ever met in game development, who I've talked to about their own path into development, everybody has a different story. There isn't like, you know, sometimes people say that uh, game they, they talk about, you know, oh, well, games are a young medium. They haven't been around <laughs> that long. It's like, ah, I don't know. They've been around for kind of a while now, yeah. honestly. Um, so I'm not sure that that excuse holds up, and yet it's still the case that you have some of these, like, there's stuff like DigiPen and other, uh, you know, USC has a games program. Um, there, there's some like formal education that you could take to get into game development. But a lot of people still, uh, I'm sure the vast majority of people get into it through, it kind of through uh, side doors, as it were. Um, and that's because that's possible because game development is so like interdisciplinary anyway. You know, it needs artists, it needs musicians, mm -hmm. it needs writers, it needs programmers, it needs designers, and it needs marketing people, it needs like statisticians, ec economists, like all kinds of different things at this point um, can contribute to game development. So there's no, I, I, the question comes up of well, a lot of like, how do I get in? And there's no, there's really no easy answer there. It depends so much on people's individual context, but I think the best rule of thumb is just to start as soon as possible, start practicing the kind of work you think you might want to be doing, um, because at worst you'll find out whether you you <laughs> actually want to do it or not. Um, because enjoying games and enjoying making games are really different things. Yes. Um, and and in fact, uh, they can be in conflict. Like as with anything, you know, when when your hobby becomes becomes your job, you actually kind of like put the hobby part of it at risk. Mm -hmm. um, the, the part that you loved about it, you know, suddenly you're having to do it on a timeline and all kinds of stuff that may threaten your, like, kind of innate love for it. So it's really important just to try and do the work and see if you appreciate the process uh, of doing it because um, it's it's just not always... Because a lot of it is going to not not be as fun as the actual yes. uh, play, playing of games. Yeah, so, so I, think, I think that's it. I still have yet to see, like, after all this time, I still don't know of a good... I'm personally always really skeptical of like advice I see and read of like, here's how to get into the game industry. I'm like, ah, I don't know. It's just everybody has a different way about it. Yeah. And like for myself, like I've been interviewing game developers for the last 10 years and I have, excuse me, never heard the same story twice about right. how that they makes got sense. in. Yeah. It's, and yet yeah, it's, I think, and we're talking about that in chat as well, that the game industry is not, and I kind of want to get your thoughts on this as well, Greg. Like, it's definitely not in its infancy anymore. In one second. Yeah. Oh, good. My voice is dying. We haven't even started yet. That's a very good sign. And I do feel that a lot of people still don't really, I think, I'm not sure if respect is the right word or understand, I think, the amount of work 
that goes into making any game, let alone it being, you know, a game of the year winner or just making a simple project guy, you know, running from left to right jumping. Yeah. Yeah, I I mean I agree with that. Um, but I I have like a I'm I I both agree and I'm also like completely comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. Like I think that I don't think game players have to bear the burden of like knowing how much work went into something. Yeah. Like that it's not they're they're playing a game just to enjoy it. They don't need to know um, definitely the try the trials and tribulations that went into it. Like I I just don't think that that comes to mind when you're like. You don't want to be thinking about that necessarily when when you're like engaging with entertainment. Maybe if you're mm -hmm. engaging with like art with a capital A and you know you know yeah. what what the artist went through, that's one thing. But if you're just like sitting down to watch some Netflix or whatever, <laughs> like you don't you don't want to know about you, you're not responsible for knowing about the pain, pain and suffering that that might have gone into it. But for sure, game making is um, it's. It's never speaking from my experience. It is, no aspect of it has ever gotten easier at any point. Um, I thought maybe it would over time, but having done it now for you know a dozen years, I can say and you know maybe I could do this for another you know a couple of dozen years or something like that if I'm lucky. Um, but yeah, at the at the current rate, I'm like this is always going to be this is always going to be hard, like inherently. Yeah. But that's actually what I like. It's like, it, it. That's what I like about it in a way. It's like kind of what I like about video games. It's like the, it's like the challenge of it, right? It, it mm -hmm. feels, it feels worth pursuing because it's always just kind of like, just a little bit out of reach. Everything yeah. we're trying to get to happen is is hard. Like, it, it's, it's always just this moving target, right? Because both the technology is changing and the like. The, the actual like design yeah. knowledge the, the the design evolution is changing and and people's like tastes the the kind of collective consciousness of what is even interesting and palatable and compelling that's always changing too so when all those things are changing at the same time it's really hard uh, to stay on top of it um, and I think I, I honestly think involves a, a certain amount of luck um, in addition to just really trying to keep up with what is is relevant and interesting when it comes to games. Yeah, and I think that's something that I've been talking to a few developers about lately as well, that so much of the industry has moved forward. Like I said, like the last 10 years have been just, you know, light speed in terms of how much yeah. game development has grown. And I think one of the big things is that what worked five years ago, what worked three years ago, doesn't really work today. Like, I just had a uh, cast with uh, Rami Ishmael, Ishmael, and we were talking about this, that his games were very successful, but if they were to be released today, they would have done nowhere near as good. And it's a very, like you said, this is a very hard industry. And uh, Oscar's point in chat about game dev tools are more accessible now, like, yeah. that is definitely true, but I think that just makes it even that much harder for a game to stand out. Like, um... Yeah, yeah exactly. I was telling you that I do uh, weekly spotlights on indie games, and I, last month alone, I looked at at least 70 different indie titles, and the spectrum of quality there is just astronomical. Like, I've yeah. played some games that are you can tell the developer put everything they had into it. Yeah. Just as I can play something that looks like somebody did this in like two months, you know, it looks, I hate to use the term like cookie cutter, but it just looks like something that I've seen time and time again. And it is very hard for these games, I feel, to stand out. Even the good games these days yeah. are having a hard time standing out. Yeah, I, um, for sure. It's, it's like you said, the, um, and, and like, uh, um, uh, I think it's uh, Oscar and Chat yeah. uh, made the point uh, that it's uh, so. I think it's really good in the in the grand scheme of things that um, ga a game development has become much much more accessible, right? Like you can, what's what's stopping you essentially is you know the availability of an inter internet connection and whether you have the time and like a, a and like a system that can run these tools. 
the time is a big one, right? Like learning something like Unity um, is a big undertaking, but um, it's it's not the days like in the in the in the two thousands when I was working at Gamespot, if you got that like Unreal license, that was like a million dollar license that you know giant game development studios mm-hmm. could afford. But as like a as like a hobbyist, you're not you're not going to be like you don't have access to something like that um, for the most part. Uh, they, they it did in the later two thousands. Of course, it started to open up and and things like Unity and even and Unreal as well um, started to like become part of the conversation as more and more independent independent developer uh, started to spring up because it got more viable you know with more digital the rise of steam and more digital distribution platforms and stuff like that it made it so that there are other ways to distribute your your game besides like putting it in a plastic case and selling it for sixty dollars at a best buy right mm-hmm. suddenly it opens things up a lot and and of course uh mobile gaming also is really taking off so now you can make a, your kind of like garage game and sell it for 99 cents and maybe it'll take off but like you said the the consequence um the the side effect is that the um the, with the lower barrier to entry there's a ton of stuff out there and a ton of like really extraordinary talent out there too uh, there's always going to be someone not just a little better than you but like probably way better mm-hmm. than you uh, making something super amazing and still struggling for that game uh, to get noticed and to get attention. So it, it, kind of like what I was saying earlier, you know, no aspect of this uh, has gotten any easier, I feel like, in the part where you're, you're trying to get your game to get noticed. That part, that, my comment definitely applies to that. It, like it, it, it has always felt like a, a hustle, uh, as it were, to just get people to notice or, or care about your video game. And that's true even for you know, our, our studio has made some games that at this point are, are like relatively well known for a studio for our size, stuff like Bastion and Transistor, you know, quote unquote, people have heard of those games. And even still, um, we, it's partly because we haven't like made sequels to those games or anything like that. But when we, when we set about, you know, announcing a game like Pyre or announcing a game like Hades, it's, it's a big undertaking for us, and we 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 have all those concerns about whether anyone's going to notice or care, and all that kind of stuff. It's yeah. it's tough out there. People have to get creative and um, and try new stuff because yeah, if they just kind of try to follow a playbook that they've seen, chances are it's already obsolete if it's been documented. Yep, and that's again like something that I've seen from a lot of in the independent scene when a game like uh, Bastion or Darkest Dungeon or FTL like blows up like that that people then try to emulate those successes and they end up releasing a game that, you know, by the time it comes out, everyone has either moved on or they're still playing that original game. Yeah, that can certainly happen too. It, it you know, it um, it happens sometimes, game, game development is also, um, or, or rather like games in general, they obviously are like people use the term derivative it has like a negative connotation but games are highly derivative of each other i think is like kind of a a general st- i don't think that that's a bad thing in the sense that that's how like game genres are created yeah. um you know street uh, i loved street fighter 2 when i was in in high school i still play fighting games and it's like all fighting games <laughs> are highly derivative of street fighter 2 and that's not a bad thing they've like refined that formula for decades now um yeah. Uh, so there are good cases of it, but in order to, yeah, like if you emulate an existing form, um, what I always say with my colleagues is like you have to, your your sort of iteration on that format has to not just be like better, it has to be like overwhelmingly better yeah. for to draw to draw people from that original game. So like you know, look at like a Minecraft or something, right? Like Minecraft spawned. Uh, countless imitators and some a few of them have been very successful also um, but um sorry screaming kids in the background uh, working from home the um so but like yeah for every you know terraria or something terraria is like mm-hmm. quite a different take on minecraft and was very successful but they're countless you know unknown much more kind of straight ahead minecraft uh, clones or, or whatever that you know have gone by the wayside, but who knows why people like like people make games for different reasons also, right? Like 
you might look at something like that and be like, oh, why'd you just make a Minecraft clone or something? But to that person, if they are like studying game development, like they went through it, that like that's their Mm -hmm. That's their version of Minecraft. They actually did the work and built it, and and that, and that's something to be proud of. Like they didn't necessarily have the ambitions of it becoming, you know, the next huge game on the market. They just wanted to actually create and ship something. And yeah. and like you were saying before, just just any game, even the most simple game, is hard to make uh, because nothing is like kind of for free. All 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 of a game player's assumptions about what would be easy in game <laughs> development they're they're really um they're really just assumptions uh it, it, it can be really surprising what is hard versus what's easy in game development and i've been on projects where like literally the hardest part of the project was just like making a menu with buttons on it it was stuff that when you play a game and you see a menu you're like that's got to be the easiest thing of all right mm -hmm. it's just a menu it's just buttons but even stuff like that can be extremely difficult under certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. And like we were saying, I think you had a really good point there about how every game has kind of like that basic DNA. Like if you play a fighting yeah. game, a platform, or an action game, and it really comes down to what you can actually iterate on. What can you make like yourself? Like what can you make that stands out? And I always feel like that's one of those major elements there. And yeah, like uh, Sharky is saying, we have memes now of all the uh, misconceptions uh, that gamers have said. I think our favorite one is that multiplayer can be done in a weekend. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. No, that's a, that's the that's a classic. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. like just add. Yeah, hey, are you gonna add? Are you gonna add multiplayer? It's like ah, uh, you. And we we went through. We have a very direct experience around that because our. Um, uh, Pyre, the game we made uh, prior to Hades, oh, yes. uh, is a game that has like a versus mode in it, and we we investigated um, the possibility of online multiplayer and so on. Did quite a bit of work into it, only to discover that like we're you know we we basically got to the base of Mount Everest, and it's like yep, we'd <laughs> have to be way up there in order to have like good good multiplayer per the standard of of the day because yeah. uh, the standard is extraordinarily high. Uh, so yeah, I think when it comes to something like multiplayer, it has to be like a foundational component yeah. of the entire project. You don't just you don't just <laughs> like if if you add it to the game, it's going to feel like you just added it to the game, and no one's chances are no one's going to play it. Oh yes, and with this discussion about indie games, I think this is a good segue or good time to bring in Oscar's other question. What elements do you think make an indie game stand out for the consumer as a possible buy? Yeah, I mean. It's no, the the list can be a mile long, right? It, it's not any one thing. It just has to be. I would just say it has to be like something, but it could be anything. What what that thing is, right? It could be like an art style choice. It could be like the like a specific mechanic. Like this is a more like totally an old school example, right? But with something like Braid, like back in the day, it's like oh, it's a platformer, but you can rewind time. Cool. That sort of thing. I think the like feature-driven indie game. I feel like that's not as much of a thing um, these days anymore. Where like one mechanic is what mm -hmm. sells you on the game, but it could it, it still happens from time to time. I think um, art style still oh, sometimes yes. is a driving factor. Like there was the the game uh, Gris or yeah, Grease uh, uh, last year that 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 like you know or something even something like. Um, the, uh, Ori and the Blind Forest in its recent sequel, like you see that game and it's just amazing looking and you're like, I don't even need to know more, I'm in. Or Cuphead of course is like a yeah. really um, maybe the most relevant example in that regard in the last few years of like, it's a it's a very like classic kind of conventional game format of like a shoot 'em up but but the art style was so striking and so uh, incredibly well executed that that like people couldn't help but um, but just want to experience it. Um, but, uh, um, you know, those are just, I think those kind of, I think those kind of superficial compo components, and I mean that like both with regard to the feature uh, and the look, um, I think they're important because to the earlier point where like there's just so much stuff out there, um, it's hard, it's hard to, if your game is hard to explain and you 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 don't and and there isn't something about it that is unique that you mm -hmm. can point out 
um, it's going to be a lot harder to get it to be noticed. And and as Supergiant, we've really run into that ourselves because our games are not like based on any one feature um, necessarily. So our our games is kind of biggest uh, selling point, as it were, um, ever since Bastion is that hey, we made Bastion. Uh, not to not to like. Um, be too uh, self-deprecating or anything, but we we rely on um, to some extent players having been familiar with with our work uh, in the past, and in you know in Bastion's case, we're like, oh, it's it's a reactive narrator. Everything you do in the game, uh, narrator is going to talk about it. But if you've played Bastion, that's hardly you know that that's only kind of the tip of the iceberg with that game. But at the time, it was enough to to get people. That turned out to be enough to get people to notice it. Mm-hmm. And I like how you just like in the last minute like name drop some of my favorite games of the last like three years between Ori, Cuphead, Greece, oh, cool. and so on. There, yeah, yeah, and yeah. I think and I do feel that you're right about that. And there has to be some kind of hook for somebody to play your game. And I like that. I'm glad that you mentioned some of the other games from Super John because it actually takes me to this next question I wanted to ask you. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I felt was kind of interesting about how the independent scene has grown in the last decade has been, I think, this kind of moving away from kind of the game or the genre defining a studio. Like when we look at like major companies, like BioWare is the RPG company, NetherRealm fighting games, Nintendo platformers, and they've even differentiated themselves more since then. But from the independent scene, it feels like, like when I look at some of my favorite indie studios, like Super Giant, Kid Fox, um, even the developers like Arkin Games, and again, I play like ninety indie games, so my mind is like a little frazzled in terms of naming studios. It's not really about the studio being defined by a game genre, but kind of I think like the studio. Uh, I guess having their own like sense of personality, their own like yeah. branding along those lines. Yep. Yeah, I, I see that for sure. Like another couple of examples that that spring to mind as you were talking about that. There's like Cappy, you know, who made uh, Below and yeah. and Sword and Sorcery way back when, and, and uh, Grindstone, like totally different games. Um, and and uh, uh, Clay Entertainment, um, you know, yes. from Don't Starve to Invisible Ink. So they they've kind of and and um, uh, Griffland. So they they've kind of done stuff like all over the place and yet they're they're a really good example of like they have a even though their games have like a totally different visual style as well from game to game there there is there is a certain feel to it they have like certain common values um and and i think uh i i think that's just like that's just game developers um taking the opportunity to try different things um i think independent game developers have um, maybe a bit more freedom yep. than like big AAA studios on the whole to, to they they not only they freedom may not be the right word they have like the the necessity to have to um, do things that stand out like based on what we were talking about before so um, unless their last game was like a mega smash hit um, they they may be better off trying something different with their next one, um, just just to kind of like keep rolling the dice and see what sticks, you know. Because yeah, standards and tastes are always changing, and so on. And they may just be interested in trying uh, different ideas. Uh, for us at Supergiant, we've certainly tried uh, different stuff. We we've tried to push ourselves kind of out of our creative comfort zone with each successive game. But with Hades, you know, for the first time, we kind of like went back. Again, it's still really different for us because hey, we've never mm-hmm. made like a. It's a, it's like an early access roguelike dungeon crawler, which is totally totally different from anything we've done in the yeah. past, like really foundationally. But the like moment to moment interactions, the the kind of like combat play, um, it certainly has similarities uh, to Bastion, especially yeah. our first game. So aspects of it are, well, to in our case we. We really try to consciously build on what we've learned and what we've also enjoyed doing in the past. Um, so it's benefited from us having made three different games uh, leading up to this fourth one, and and it pulls in like ingredients from all three of those prior games, kind of into its own uh, mashup. But yeah, like sticking to a certain genre, you know, the genres themselves are always evolving, and 
Um, there's no game development is always like a challenge between do you want to get ultra specialized or do you want to be more of a generalist? Like even as an individual working in game development, you're faced with those choices of like um, how to how to both be the best in the world at like mm -hmm. one specific thing and also just kind of like <laughs> not be so narrow in your specialization that you might like not be useful to game development anymore if you're yeah. if you're not careful. It's 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 tough, and I think it applies even to like choosing which kind of games to make. That's why you know maybe some indep independent developers aren't sticking too closely to the same format over and over. Mm -hmm. And like I was saying at the start, <coughs> my voice really is starting to go allergies and all that. But like we could easily like just dedicate a cast per uh, game from Super Giant. Like we can certainly delve into. I'm resisting that temptation. <laughs> I know we have so much to talk about, but. Uh, one thing that I wanted to ask you before we talk a little bit more about like Hades and Supergiant, again, like as somebody who's been following the game industry from both outside and inside, I wanted to ask you, like, as somebody working in the independent space, what has it been like, I guess, being there for the last decade? Because, like I said, like the last ten years have been just monumental in terms of I think everyone's expectations as well as just the I think growing acceptance of the game industry. So, like, I can, you know, I can, of course, say this as a gamer and talking about it, but I want to get your thoughts as somebody who's been working for the last 10 years. Yeah, I mean, it's, what can I say? It's certainly been a roller coaster ride. It's, um, it has, for me personally, it really has had its, its ups and downs. Um, like I said, it's never gotten any easier. Um, but, you know, the roller coaster ride analogy, uh, kind of carries through, and a lot of it's it's certainly uh, thrilling. It's never it, it, it it's never a dull moment. The game industry is always an interesting place. If there's one thing I've learned, it's like to expect the unexpected. Like my my favorite games each year, um, almost invariably are games where like I had no idea they even existed. Mm -hmm. um, like before that. Year, right like at the end of each year there, here you see these lists of like most anticipated games for the following year um and there's always a lot of exciting stuff on there but in addition to that there's always like some really big surprises like last you know just in the last few months a game like disco elysium yes. just just like blowing up onto the scene and you know if you're into um rpgs and interesting narrative design and stuff like that it's mm -hmm. like a kind of a revelatory experience and i i love that stuff like that even though it's too, it's like super unexpected on on a case by case basis, but broadly, um, you can count on those surprises happening uh, pretty regularly. So I like that about games a lot, and I they've just kind of always been a part of my life. Um, so I I just I I just always count my blessings, like getting a chance to work on them, and I it's 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 grueling. Uh, a lot, uh, but when I and a lot of the time working on games is spent not actually working on the game itself, and I find myself like you know desperately wanting to get back to the development part of it. But when I'm when I'm in the thick of like working on a game and working on our stories and spaces and all that kind of stuff, I I, I love it as much as ever, even though it's as hard as ever. So some things. But like you said, a lot of aspects of it have really, really changed a lot. Um, I think the media landscape has really has gone through its most dramatic transformation since when I got started. Like when I got started in the gaming press, it was when you know print magazines were still king, and these like websites were all just a bunch of rude upstarts. And I just <laughs> see that same sort of thing has happened uh, over the last few years, but this time with. Uh, you know, gaming websites kind of versus, uh, you know, influencers, you, oh, yeah. streamers and content creators and so on. Um, but it's like, this is, so it's been really interesting to see um, that that transformation, how that, that changes things and how like streaming has just sort of become a part of life. Like I watch Twitch uh, <laughs> day, day and night just as, as, as part of my life, like unrelated to my job. Um, <laughs> So those kind of environmental factors have really changed a lot, but I think like down 
at the at the end of it, the part that stays the same is that there's always really interesting games to play, and that that's the part that like keeps me centered. That's been the like one of the only kind of constants in my life. So I really gravitate toward games, like if only for that reason. They're just kind of always always there for me. Yeah. And the thing about like those surprise games, like for myself, I just found a world of horror at the start of this year that I've been really loving, a uh, one bit style horror game. And, like, last year, I had a game that I really love called Vision Software Set, which is kind of like a Metroidvania with a time rewind as kind of its mm-hmm. chief mechanic. And that's always been, I think, one of the beauty of the game, of the independence scene, is that, like you said, like, it's not really, like, I think, by choice, but by necessity, that they have to innovate. They have to do something different, because no indie developer can stand toe-toe making, you know, Red Dead Redemption. Or right. competing with Nintendo to make the next Mario, right? Yeah, you're not going to make like um, you're not going to make as an independent developer. You're not going to make like God of War or Horizon Zero Dawn or something mm-hmm. like that, right? Like you're you're uh, you're constrained from making something that is like uh, where the, the that kind of like raw production quality and polish and and to be clear, those games are like way more than their production quality they're just like mm-hmm. these massive uh, fully realized experiences so you have to you have to kind of focus more in a lot of ways but they're also like you know they're 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 rpgs and stuff that are uh, made by smaller teams that are also really intricate and and kind of massive in their own right maybe not on the raw like production quality but um in terms of their own scope and ambition so a small game can still be an ambitious game, if that makes mm-hmm. any sense. Like it, it, it um, and and I think part of the art of of making games is is like finding finding that sweet spot of like where can you, how far, just how far can you reach as a as an individual creator or as a team um, that doesn't like put you beyond your means Mm -hmm. but but still is is really challenging you to make something special and and interesting and those are those kinds of games you know are i think end up being really special when you when you play them yourself where it's like wow they this idea is like fully explored by this game this like really kind of unique style or unique theme um like a way a way I talk about it at Supergiant is like I make peace with our games when I when I find myself realizing well no one no one would have made this game if if not us it's like the opposite of the kind of thing that you talked about before of like it's not mm-hmm. um, you know it's not we don't just kind of go from an existing blueprint and and at a certain point I I, I my own experience of our games is like well this is this is kind of so idiosyncratic that. I don't know if it's going to be to everyone's tastes, but for some people, I think they're really going to enjoy it and have a special experience with it, if only because they haven't really experienced anything quite like it, and that in and of itself um, has has value. So I I, I look for um, I, I try to make sure I'm only working on projects that kind of like add something positive in some way, which of course is like a highly subjective idea, but in that, that's how I have to internalize it. Like, is this is this going to be? If someone plays this, will they like wish they had their? Will they wish they spent their time some other way, or will they look back on having played that game and be like, "Yeah, that was you know what that I'm better for having played that." Like that's 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 the bar I, I look for personally. Mm-hmm. Yep. And being again able to deliver something that is enjoyable to the player and that stands out on its own. I mean, there's so much we could certainly unpack with that. And I do want to talk a little bit more about Hades, as well as kind of what's been happening with the industry in the last few years. And again, like, I know you said we have a little bit of leeway, but if you give me too much, we'll be here for like five, six hours. So we have to be yeah. a little bit careful there. But one thing that I wanted to talk about with you was kind of the announcement, was kind of like how Hades was brought in with being announced at the Video Game Awards show, and of course being announced for Epic Games. And when we look back, like Hades was the first game, like that was kind of like the official, I guess, signal fire 
to let people know that this was going to be a digital store. It was competing with Steam, and it has certainly brought a lot of discussions, debates, and I know quite a few angry videos on YouTube about it. And I wanted to ask you about, and again, like if there's anything like NDA related, you know, feel free to let me know. What was kind of the decision to go with Epic Game Store? Because this is something that I've been talking to a lot of developers about in terms of the ones who go on it versus the ones who don't, and the ones who decide to be that as their first platform. Yeah, for us, so for us, it was like it just made um, a ton of sense in the sense that we were making, as, as mentioned before, we were making an early access roguelike dungeon crawler, which are like things that. We've never done like early access development for a studio like Supergiant is is like almost on the face of it, it seems totally antithetical to everything we've ever done. Like in the past we prided ourselves on, you know, we would refer to the like completeness of our games, a game like Bastion. Um, you know, you're gonna get an entire kind of fully realized experience. It's not going to be like DLC driven microtransactions, any of that kind of stuff. It's just a complete game. Um, we're going to work on it kind of in, in silence for several years and then it's going to come out and you know you'll you'll play through it and hopefully have a good experience. Whereas um, so switching to early access and the idea of like uh, working on a game out in the open, um, it seemed uh, it, it was we knew it was going to be a really big change. So we it made total sense for us to begin that process. Uh, not on our biggest, most vocal uh, platform, um, so that by the time we came to that platform, we would have a better chance of knowing what the heck uh, we were doing. Uh, because you only get one chance to make a first impression uh, with games, and um, and we knew that we were taking a really big risk by making a game like Hades and and you know launching it after only a year of development instead of after three years like our last. Games like it was, it was just like a, a worse game at launch than you know something like Pyre Transistor in the sense that it wasn't it wasn't complete, it wasn't polished to our standard, all this kind of stuff. Um, and we would have to you know continue working on it um, while absorbing you know tons mm -hmm. of player feedback and all this kind of stuff. So we had to we had to learn to you know walk and then learn to run and so on. And thankfully, the response to the initial launch was like super positive, and we picked up a a really like um, just it's a really enthusiastic player base that the wind at our, at our backs and made us really excited to keep pushing forward so that by the time uh, we came to Steam uh, late last year the game was way better for it and and people like it you know people responded accordingly uh, it's our best received Steam game ever um, like like empirically <laughs> like if you just look at the reviews of Hades versus the reviews of Pyre or Transistor or, or, or Bastion. It is like a more well-loved game than those games, according to Steam customers, you know, at least right now. Um, so we were, I was blown away, I was shocked by that. And I still am, as you can hear uh, from from my voice. And I, I, I think Hades is a good game, but I didn't think, you know, it's hard, like Bastion, Bastion is like a game that people, you know, I, it, it hit, our games sometimes hit people at the right place at the right time. We don't like endeavor to make games that are better than our past games necessarily. Just games that like live up to what we've done in the past. So when we ended up getting like even better reviews, it was really, um, yeah, it was stunning. And that that is uh, that is entirely because we we worked on it and made it better um, until until we were ready to launch on Steam. So yeah, it made um, and and also with early access developments, like we couldn't. Um, there was no way that we could like run our early access on multiple platforms at once right from the start because it, it's all about like rapidly uh, being able to iterate uh, on your game and update frequently and so on. And just updating a game is not inherently easy. So if you're <laughs> trying to run your early access, you know, on console and PC at the same time, it, it, uh, that would be it would be a total nightmare <laughs> and beyond the means of of our of our small team. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy that you mentioned about early access because I think that's another very interesting topic. Again, so many of our topics, I always say this, like we could dedicate an entire cast yeah. to there. Does that involve? But with like your work at Super Giant, again, going from games like Bastion, Pyre, Transistor to working on early access game, I guess for the people uh, watching us, live recorded, what was was there anything like interesting, like anything you had to like shift in terms of your mindset? 
working on oh, yeah. early access compared to releasing a finished game. Yeah, I mean, it's totally, it's like, tra it, it is transformative. It's, it's completely, it's completely different. Um, so not just a little different. Um, and in many, like, it's, it's like, our big, our, our hypothesis was, or like, or like the, our question going into it was like, can we reconcile the things that we've done well in the past with early access development, which seems to lend itself to games that are really different from the kind of games that we've made. Because like a game like Transistor, many people finish it, you know, in six or seven hours or something like that, and they'll they'll they may really enjoy that experience, but it's not this like protracted game. It wouldn't like that game wouldn't work at all in early access. It would be it just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Uh, that game was certainly not worth playing until it was complete and, and fully polished and all that. And even if we had early access of it, people would like burn through it in a few hours, they'd never come back. Like it just wouldn't work. Um, um, and it's the sort of game that's like not even like you know playable necessarily, like in the in from start to finish for much of development. Um, whereas something like Hades, you have to build like kind of the the quote unquote minimal minimum viable product like it has to be mm -hmm. fully complete in itself at all times um so we built it in like a highly modular way where we could like add to many different dimensions of it and kind of keep expanding it but the part where it ties back to our past work is like there's still it's still part of a narrative it's still a world and and we know where it's going to end um or like what what kind of the outcome of the story uh where it's headed as it were, um, and and the part where we have melded uh, narrative into an early access game is something I feel really good about. That I don't uh, I don't think has been done um, certainly to the extent that we're doing it. The idea it's almost like a it's almost like a serial show or something like that. Where for each of our updates, we're expanding the story, and you know we've often added characters and new dimensions to the story, and so on. So. Uh, the, our ability that we we wondered if we could have a narrative game in early access, and we felt like we had an idea for how we could do it, but we had to test that and prove that out. And I'm I'm really excited about how that's been going so far. It's been a ton of fun to work on that aspect and like get the immediate feedback instead of like uh, you know with Hades, I we could like add a character like a whole new storyline between updates. Um, and get the immediate feedback from players, you know, what, do they like this character or not? Did, this, did they understand what was going on even? Mm -hmm. Whereas with something like Pyre, um, I just kind of work on it in relative isolation for the entire time. You know, I have this whole <laughs> cast of characters. We play test and everything. We could play test even with dozens of people, um, but it's or hundreds of people even over the course of development, but it's nothing in comparison <laughs> to having a game actually be out there in early access and getting that, like, real-time... Uh, feedback from a community about the stuff that you put in. Um, so, yeah, it's a really, it's kind of a brave new world for us. Um, it it brings with it many challenges, but I think it straight up has made for like a bigger, better game from our team. Um, so, you know, I, I I'm glad that we've it, w the game is not complete yet. So the on some level the jury is still out, but we hear from more and more people of like, man, I can't believe this is, they say it's an early access, but it's like a finished game with free DLC, you know, every, <laughs> every few months. Like that's a really nice compliment that we've seen um, uh, every, every so often um, that, that, that it's been very validating that, that our, our kind of guesses have, have worked out well for us. Yeah. And I think what you said there about the game always being like a completed project or a completed product yeah. regardless of its update, I think that's a very important point that I of more developers need to understand about early access, especially about early access today. You mentioned, of course, Clay Entertainment. Like Clay Entertainment to me seemed to be like the poster child for like early access early access success with their games. And how no matter when they release their game on early access, if Again, it feels like a well-made title from beginning to end. Like you can play this and go, "Yeah, I get this game. I know exactly what developers want to do. I know what they're trying to achieve." And then what you said about it, then it just feels like it's free DLC every month or every two to three months or things like that. 
And I felt the same way about Hades. And for my audience watching me, like I've said this before, that there are games that I've played in early access that I know very early on whether or not it feels like it's going to do really well. Hades, Slay the Spire, again, pick a Clay Entertainment game, etc. And again, it's one of those things that we're talking about, like it sounds very easy to do, but it obviously is very, is not. Yeah, the, um, for sure. The, so those kind of examples, like for us, you know, the, the short list, uh, Slay the Spire was one of those games that was inspiring to us. Uh, Dead Cells, you mentioned Darkest Dungeon um, earlier in the conversation. Games like that were like, yeah, we, you know, I personally and my colleagues had a similar experience where, you you know, Darkest Dungeon and Dead Cells, I think I got both of those games day one in early access. And they were like awesome. Yes. Like from that moment, there was no... Yeah, they you know they'll have a splash screen just like in Hades. That's like you know the game isn't done, so you know have mercy and understand that uh, we're going to be adding to it. Uh, but what was there, like the foundation, was so strong and so compelling that you're just kind of excited to see it evolve. And also, even just as a game player, I have this experience of like, hey, I put my like 20 hours or whatever into like early access launch version of Dead Cells. If for some reason I never come back to this game, I like already got my yeah my money and time's worth on this game. So that was very much our standard of like this, we will never kind of make excuses for the present. We, we will say in which ways like the game is incomplete and what we intend to add to it, but we'll never make excuses about like the state of the quality of it. Like we, we because we're selling it to you, like for the price of our finished games in the past, it has to be able to offer mm -hmm. like a, like a basically a comparable experience at, at, at the worst. Um, and yeah, you've seen, you know, early access, like kind of the, the, the kind of best practices around early access, I suppose, have evolved over time. Whereas there, there certainly have been um, cases, there were and continue to be cases of like much more open-ended early access developments where it's like, we're still figuring out what this is. We're not sure when we're going to be done. You know, here's something, mm -hmm. send us your feedback. But we wanted to approach it, in our case, we wanted to approach it in somewhat of a more regimented way. Um, and that's also because we had this narrative ambition. Like we don't, we're not looking to our audience to like tell us what the game, you know, is supposed to be. But we're really interested in their feedback about their experience uh, and about their thoughts on, you know, what, what fell short for them and how it could be better and so on. Like we're really, really want to know that kind of stuff. Um, and hopefully that makes players feel good as well. Like I think if if players have enjoyed our games in the past, hopefully they just kind of want us to keep doing our thing, you know, keep wanting the people who made the kind of games we've made in the past to like keep doing what they're doing on some level. So um, early access doesn't like sort of threaten that as it, it, it's not like we're just going to put out, it's not just suddenly this super like democratized, you know, audience, just tell us what to do. Tell us what, what we're going to build, you know, take the wheel sort of thing. Um, I, I still want game teams to put themselves into their work and not not just to rely on you know what the numbers say, right? Because um, because those kind of experiences can be can feel pretty sterile in their own way when it's just like kind of a popularity contest, you know, do do whatever the Reddit community is saying or something like that. With all due respect, of course, <laughs> it's like the the feedback is super important, but it, as a developer, you have to find that line between like. How do you synthesize the feedback? Is it just you mm -hmm. do whatever your audience says? You can't. You're not going to win people over. That that's like a losing battle to try and just make people happy that way. Because mm -hmm. as game players, we, we we don't necessarily know exactly what we want. Like like those game those games that we referred to, you know, the Disco Elysiums, they're successful because they're unexpected. Um, so game developers have to give themselves that that leeway to do things that the audience isn't necessarily asking for yeah. I think yeah and again like all these topics we're talking about are like lead to like 40 minutes to an hour long discussions yeah, yeah. and like it's something that we've been talking about a lot more especially when I was covering those indie games during the uh, Steam Spring Festival I mean it was two weeks ago that you can tell when a team really loves their idea like, you can kind of sense that passion behind it and again, it's one of those things that it's hard to put into words, but you know it when you see it. And yeah. like you just said, like if you were to design a game by committee, 
you kind of lose that. You lose, like, I think the developer's voice in the process. Yes. Yeah. yeah. To me, to me, it actually, like, I, I, I've tried to, you know, I've had all this time to think about, like, precisely what you said. Like, what is what is that exactly? What, what, what makes it so that when you play a game, sometimes you're like, man, this development team was, like, on fire mm -hmm. and they loved what they were doing. Like, what, what are the... What are the things that make that register? And 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 to me, like the best answer I have for that is like it's the it's actually just the small stuff. That's all it is. It's just it's the small stuff where even if you don't know that much about game development and game production, you you it's the stuff where you could say like they didn't need to do that. Like strictly speaking, like maybe even they shouldn't have done that. Like that that detail, man, mm -hmm. that must have taken a lot of work and it's kind of unnecessary. I'm surprised I even noticed that. Um, the more games have those little touches, that's when you're like, man, people, the the team was kind of having fun with this. Mm -hmm. They were I I experimenting with, with this, and they they just kind of, um, uh, and 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 suddenly, you know, the the game experience itself is like idi idiosyncratic and different, and you know, sometimes it's just kind of weird, and mm -hmm. you know, it might be funny, all all kinds of things like that, and then and then you find even after you're done playing, that's a game that you remember. Uh, because of those weird little quirks, um, so yeah, I think I, I really appreciate games that are kind of loaded up with with those kind of small touches that that you know I wouldn't have thought of, uh, and and I I wonder about the design conversations you know that led to them and mm -hmm. the tough choices they had to make where someone was probably like, man, we're spending a lot of time on this goofy thing, should we keep doing this? And they're like, yeah, <laughs> let's do it. Um, that I, I I look for that stuff in games. And I think that's a good segue to talk more about the design. And um, just as a point, I know we just crossed the hour-long mark. I guess, uh, do you have like a rough time just so I can keep track, you know, for my questions? Oh, um, uh, uh, I, I, I could go to like what, 115 or something like that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, for the audience watching, if you do have any questions for Greg about Hades at this point, uh, feel free to get them in the comments. In about, like, I would say, like seven, eight minutes, that will be last call for questions. And I always say this: that if you're free in the future, Greg, uh, I would more than happy to have you back on. Like I said, like we could spend a podcast just talking about each one of Super Giants sure. games. There's just so much to talk about. Yeah. Th yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So, uh, with Hades, again, like, there's a lot that I want to try and delve into. We'll see how much we can get into. But I think the first thing I want to talk about, like you said, like, weaving the narrative into Hades was such an important point. And again, it's one of those features, I think, that really does help to elevate it. And I want to kind of ask about kind of, like, how the story was developed, like, in that sense. Like, one thing that I loved is that you guys have managed to take the roguelike gameplay loop and spin it into the narrative. The fact that you right. are living, dying, and repeating, and it makes perfect sense because you're a demi, you're a demi guy. Like you know, right. there's no uh, ludo, there's no narrative dissonance here. You can't yeah. be killed. Yeah, exactly. We we looked we looked for that um, when when like choosing the, the the theme of the game. Like we we knew we started uh, from more like a broader place of like we knew we wanted to make an early access game that was like the first decision that we made even before we knew anything about what it was going to be and then and then it was like well if it's going to be early access like what what is a theme you know what is a narrative that that makes sense within that structure oh and i should say um not just an early access game but an early access game with a roguelike structure so a game that was designed around replayability so we're like, okay, we're going to make a game that instead of having like a traditional beginning, middle, and end, you know, six or eight hours or whatever, it's going to be a game that you can play indefinitely. So what does that now mean? Um, what sort of narrative uh, would work within that kind of structure? C it could like support that kind of structure without the kind of dissonance uh, that you're referring to. Um, and and this idea of, um, you know, breaking free of the underworld, I... I referred to it as like a reverse Diablo. You know, mm -hmm. the the old school Diablo was like you fight your way down to hell. It's like, oh, what if you had to fight your way out of hell? It's kind of fun. And um, and um, the, the I and several of my colleagues have lot, you know, loved Greek myth uh, mm -hmm. since we were young and realized we had like a we had a perspective on it that felt like it was unexplored. You know, again, when we kind of looked around at uh, Greek myth, obviously is like a really well worn 
uh, theme in media, not just in games, you know, Clash of the Titans and, and whatever else, the you know, Percy Jackson, right? Um, not to mention God of War and everything. It's like kind of all over the place. And yet we, so our bar was like, do we have, do we have something to say here that, that we don't think has been said? Um, it, we felt similarly back in the day about Transistor when we set out to make like a cyberpunk game. We're like, do we have something to add to this genre that, that we don't feel like already covered and you know between matrix and deus ex and blade runner and all those kind of like classic works so um yeah the, you know from there it was really about like finding a narrative structure that harmonized with what the actual play experience was um and a lot of the we we definitely like our past work on pyre like directly influenced what you know what I was excited about, what we were all excited about to do on Hades, like having a bigger cast of characters, um, and and a, I guess most importantly, a game structure that only ever moved forward. So there's no game over state. The story always moves forward, uh, no matter what. So you fight a boss and you die to the boss. Instead of it like resetting you, the next time you get to that boss, that boss is going to go like, hey. Yeah. Like you think you're gonna take me this time? <laughs> I, I I worked you last time. You know what chance do you have? Um, and that was really exciting to us uh, to explore. And we kind of we did we did something similar in Pyre though with a really different game structure. Um, so it it was like a it's a scary idea because it's like how how much story do you put into a game that people can play forever? Turns out you have to put in a lot. <laughs> but um, with the early access nature of it we've had many opportunities to just kind of keep expanding on it. And th at this point there's like a, you know, we have people tell us they've been playing for hundreds of hours and still discovering like new story events. And I'm like, yes, that's awesome. Cause I want the characters to feel alive. And if, mm -hmm. if they run out of content, they start repeating the same lines over and over it. Like it, it, it's immersion breaking, right? When, when you play a video game and you're like, you hear a fire in the hole exactly the same way <laughs> for the umpteenth time, you're like, okay, I'm just playing a video game. It's no longer a story. So you have to have a lot of stuff in there for, for the characters to actually feel like they're reacting in part of the world. Yeah, like for my audience watching, we play a few games later that we just heard like the same bark over and over <laughs> again for like an hour of playing. <laughs> and we're we can, all starting can, to get stir uh, crazy. We we just like our, our solution to that. Yeah, at, at Supergiant, what we do is we just record a ton of variations and then we do a thing where like it'll just never most of our line in our past games our lines just like actually just never repeat for the most part ever that was our going into bastion our first game that was our rule we're like he's just never going to repeat himself period <laughs> it'll only move the story will only move forward because the moment you hear this guy repeat himself your immer your immersion is shattered the illusion that it's a story being told is it, it breaks um so the only the only answer is to not have him repeat at all mm-hmm uh, we got a few questions in chat that came up. Uh, Theo asked, uh, your games are very thematically tight. Do you go into that intentionally, or do you discover what you're saying as you go? Yeah, it, uh, so uh, thank you, Theo, for, for that. Um, it's something certainly that we aspire to. Um, I, think, I think it's a little of each. Um, we choose, we have an idea for the theme up front, for sure. Uh, but we choose a theme... Um, that's that's rich to us in some ways uh, that we don't think um, that, that that doesn't have some sort of prescriptive it, it, it's not like a it's not like something where there's going to be a moral of the story at the end you know and therefore you know you should do this uh, I, I I am just more much more interested in like exploring ideas than in in kind of like prescriptive solutions and that keeps our themes like pretty open-ended so that all throughout while I'm working on the story, I'm just like finding new dimensions to it and, and like discovering it for uh, for myself um, in, in some ways. Like for, for example, with, I only I don't like to like articulate the themes of our games because they're there to be kind of discovered and internalized, but Bastion is is 10 years old or whatever, so I can, I can speak to it more directly. But that was a game where like the, like a starting point for the theme of the game was like the idea of overcoming regret. Um, and, and that was like, that was a broad uh, concept, and there were then it's like well each character in the story is going to be a version of ways in which you can or maybe cannot uh, overcome regret, and they they will have like a different worldview around regret and 
and so on and so forth. So then I think like when you have a kind of a holistic idea like that uh, at the start, it can make it so that it ends up feeling cohesive at the end, hopefully, even though the story and the characters may go uh, in a whole bunch of different directions uh, while you're at it. And I, I, I think I, I enjoy works like that myself and I enjoy working in that way when, when the theme is actually very like open-ended. Yeah. And I think like we've said at the start, like it's one of those things that you can always tell when it's there from the beginning. Like you don't want to be trying to find your voice with a game, you know, halfway, three quarters of the way through development. Yeah, although um, believe me, uh, it's very likely that you will be doing that. That's yeah. certainly been. You, you, it may. Um, yeah, it's always. It I like with Transistor in particular, we we would get a nice compliment from players sometimes that was like, oh, you, you know, your your games are so confident, and it's like I'd always smile because they don't. They, <laughs> I'm that it comes out looking that way. Along the way, there's so many twists and turns to development, and so much of it, even despite having like a, an idea of the theme in mind, and and in you know, on the face of it, maybe people would say like, oh, you you have a you have a very strong direction that you're going in. Like it doesn't necessarily feel like that during development. You're you're like spending so much time wandering. That's actually another benefit to early access. It just mm -hmm. we we were excited about early access so that we could like force an idea. Uh, faster and then just sort of build upon it and uh, bring it to its logical conclusion instead of like spending years just sort of wandering and trying to find our uh, find our voice. Even the finding our voice part of it is like again just sort of made easier with feedback. Like an example on Hades is that um, you know we made we made a game that on the face of it it's kind of like this actiony experience. It's a you know. Uh, you know, it, it's like a dark fantasy game, right? It's a guy with a sword, and it's it's Hades, it's Greek myth. But uh, the game turns out to have a lighthearted uh, quality. Um, but I didn't know, we didn't know how, like, the humor was going to go over. Like, humor in games is tough. Yeah. Humor in general is tough. Like, not everybody has the same sense of humor or appreciates the same jokes. But we put it out there, and the response to the humor was really, really good. And I think that, like, emboldened us to sort of push aspects of it farther and keep going with it. And then I, I think we, like even the early access process like helped us find our voice you know even after the initial uh, launch of the game yeah and i mean i could, we could spend like the next hour talking about kind of like the story and the writing of Hayes. like i love the main character like you said like the uh, banter between the characters i think is yeah. one of those really great elements of the game thank you um, yeah it's been super fun <laughs> And we got a few more questions, and I have a, I have a few that I definitely want to talk about. And again, um, I'm resisting the urge of keeping you here all uh, day and <laughs> night long. <laughs> uh, Sharky asked in chat, while when he was playing the game, he ran to a dead end of not being skilled enough to get further in the game, but at the same time couldn't get enough upgrade material to kind of compensate for that. And I know you guys have done adjustments with the difficulty settings over the last few months, but do you have any plans to let players like him have an upgrade path to kind of get farther into the game? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, from our from our perspective, um, I, I'm not sure at what state uh, Sharky played the game, but that is mm -hmm. that is not meant to be a state that uh, can occur for players in Hades ever. Um, there there should always be a way to overcome the current situation, either through skill or through progress or a combination of the two. And every run in the game is also different. So it's mm -hmm. like, just because, um, you know, if a boss, you know, rocks you one time, um, even if you learned absolutely nothing, there is still always a chance that the next time you encounter uh, that boss, uh, your, your whole, like, character configuration is going to be totally different and will let you sort of surpass that moment. We also have something in the game, like our ultimate failsafe is something called God Mode, um, mm -hmm. which is a mode that you could turn on at any time or off at any time where mm -hmm. each time it makes you tougher immediately, so you take le just mm -hmm. straight up less damage. And then if you die with God Mode on, you get uh, even, you get a little bit tougher than that. Uh, so mm -hmm. our game has a narrative ambition to it, uh, but roguelikes are also known for being quite challenging, and like for us, we need to have a solution um, so that people who are just kind of invested in the story uh, can always uh, keep moving forward. And I highly recommend uh, checking out God Mode uh, for anyone uh, who who like may be interested in the story, but maybe like may not see themselves as like a like a 
hardcore kind of like action game players, something like that. Mm -hmm. Our games, like our most important design goal um, always in all of our games, no matter what we're doing, is is to give players a sense that they're taken care of, that they're all that there's always a way for them to advance. So in Sharky's case, I don't know if we did like maybe we didn't do a good enough job of um, of making it clear that God mode is an option, or maybe Sharky looked at God mode and was like, ah, it's not really for me. I feel like I should advance in other ways. But we're continuing to the the game is is still obviously continuing to evolve, but certainly it's our goal that players never never ever feel like they're stuck there's a, there should always be something new or different that you can do yeah and i know for myself i've been playing it on hell difficulty i lost you i lost your audio oh there you go i think i'm back oh, there you go yeah because yeah, i like the masochism side of things yeah, and yeah. i play on the hard mode <laughs> and yeah. Yeah, and I think to his point that it's always the same for the first boss. I know that, yeah, I think I think uh, when I was talking to Sharp Ballet, I think he was playing this like several months ago. I know that you've had major updates since then. Yeah, we, ha we have the, like, the experience that he described. I, I can absolutely imagine happening. It's not to say it's uh, impossible by any means. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just note that it is one that we are like, as a, as a design team, we want to make sure... Um, we want to do the, our best to make sure that doesn't happen to players, that they always feel like they have tools or they have different paths or they have different choices that they can make um, to, to just keep moving things forward. And it's like, it, it, that's part of the narrative function as well too, right? So even if you're like, it's a game, that was part of our idea around it was like, hey, it's a game where it, it kind of death is a part of life in this world and die, like dying is how you, in most games when you, when you die, the story grinds to a stop. In our game, when you die, the story advances. Um, so it's like a polar opposite of how most games are structured. So um, we want that partly to like take the sting out of those inevitable defeats. And you know, you die, but you live and learn. And you know, characters will kind of talk to you about it, and uh, you'll you'll grow more invested in things and want to keep going. Hopefully, that's our that's our kind of general idea around it. Mm -hmm. And uh, one more question from chat, and I just have a few more that I want to get through for today. Uh, Brian asks, do you think about efficiency much during design development, and does efficiency play much of a role in your success? Uh, we think uh, constantly about efficiency, yes. Um, we have to as a small team. Um, and part of the decision uh, to move to early access development was entirely about that and reflecting on the development of our past couple of games where, like I said, you know, especially kind of the first year and a half or so of development, it's a lot of like wondering and soul searching and so on. So our solution to that with Hades was to plan more of the game up front, um, have, have a more specific idea of what we wanted to be like, what we wanted to focus on, what was, what was going to be compelling about it if we focused on it. Um, and then configuring our team around these regular you know, having like an update cycle basically forces you to make sure that the game is always playable and and like that you're meaningfully adding to it on a regular basis. So we're, I, I, I dare say, I think we're like pretty regimented as a team as far as like efficiency is concerned. And like I said, you know, when we're fewer than 20 people trying to like kind of make games worth a damn and keep keep going for as long as we can, we, we have to be efficient. Yeah. Um, just in order to produce anything. Yeah, I and mean, I think another very interesting hurdle about early access is again, like you said, like you have to release a a regular set of updates and patches of the game, and it's one of those things. I think from the outside, it sounds easy in practice, but no, it is not. And I've seen developers sometimes struggle with that when they say, "Oh, we're going to release an update every month." And then they start falling behind, or things yeah. end up going wrong, and it can kind of cascade out. And so much yeah. of early access is kind of like that, kind of like keeping that forward momentum going. Because yeah. the second you lose it, it becomes very hard to retain it. Yeah, it's like there are a lot of other analogies. You know, it's like whatever. It's a you know exercise routines and diets and like habits of any sort, right? It's like mm -hmm. if you if you can, I. I I feel that habits are kind of habits are just habits. They could be either good or they could be bad. Um, and and you, once you start a habit, you you kind of keep doing it. Um, and it's easier to keep doing the habit than than to not do it. But if you fall out of the habit, 
you know, it's it's harder to start it back up. Um, and early access is like it has it, it, that set of ideas kind of rings true to me working on early access where it's it you have to like be sort of regimented about it and and make a commitment to it um, and that really helps you to keep keep your momentum and keep your it helps keep your audience happy and keep getting the kind of feedback that is actually helpful to you because if you're if you're struggling and falling behind having your whole audience yelling at you that you suck and you're falling behind like that is not helping you that is like no that is contributing to like a doubt whatever downward spiral you're already in um so that's like some of the scary stuff in game development and yeah we went into that you know eyes wide open kind of honestly fearful of some of the consequences of not doing it properly and so we felt that yeah to be efficient and regimented about it was probably like our our only chance of doing it successfully really mm-hmm. yep and I to some of my questions about Hayes, and again, I'm trying to. This is going to be kind of like my Cliff's Notes set of questions because there's yes. so much we can talk about. But one thing that I really appreciate about Hayes, and something that I've seen in Transistor and Bastion, is kind of allowing the player to pick and choose how hard they want to make the game. Yep. This was something that I really love about Bastion with the various idols. And that it's not just. I think this is one of those things that, again, like I could spend an entire cast on that. I don't like it when developers just go for flat-out uh, number changes. You know, I'm going to make this enemy do 50% less damage, or, you know, I'll give you 80% more health. And with Hades, the whole, um, that whole, I forget the, the exact, uh, like, lore. The, the, pact, the Pact of Punishment. Yeah, which sounds partly apt for me, as my audience yeah. will probably agree with, that you, it's not just, we're going to make enemies do more damage, varying from, you know, lowering iframes, increasing, you know, having to give up a buff when you go from one area to the next. And I wanted to ask, like, what was kind of the process with Supergiant with, I guess, giving the player, I guess, essentially the rope to hang themselves with when it comes to Yeah, I'm, I mean, it really started with uh, the Shrine and Bastion. Yeah. Like, we, um, it was a really fun, like, it went through a lot of the shrine was like when a lot of stuff just clicked for us as a team. I think it's like when we, looking back on it, I think we were. Um, that was one of those moments when our team was coming together in a really cool way. Where like kind of our design instincts and our like approach to uh, like contextualizing our game systems in 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 the world of the game, all all that stuff just came together really nicely in that system because we had to like pick a, you know, it started as an abstract idea of like, it started from a, a straightforward observation, which is that it's weird that games make you choose your difficulty before you've played. Mm-hmm. Like, you you haven't played it yet, you don't know what the right difficulty is for you. Um, and this is at a time, actually, when games are a lot better about this now, like, typically now, you know, when a game says, you know, they're equivalent of hard mode, it'll at least come with, like, a written explanation mm-hmm. to provide, you know, oh, like, you should pick this mode if if you play a lot of first-person shooters, you're like, oh, okay, that kind of describes me. I guess I should pick that. Um, but but back in you know uh, 2010 or whatever, like games weren't even doing that. They're just easy, medium, or hard. Like, what does that even mean? Um, so we're like, we're gonna let you choose your difficulty once you've played and you have some ability to calibrate like what's appropriate for you. Is it too hard? Is it too easy? Um, so that's like the design starting point. But then we still had to theme it and make it make sense in the context of the game, and that's how it like evolved to become the shrine. I was interested in it, uh, like all of our games have had some sort of like a for more or less have had some sort of like religious or mythological uh, underpinning. So it's almost like games like Bastion were us uh, training to ultimately do something in Greek myth uh, here with Hades. But yeah, it was like the whole you know religion of the world was expressed through the difficulty system and, and the shrine. Yeah. Um, and and uh, players really, it got like really good feedback, and that was one of those things. You know, game after game, we've just kind of come back, come back to that type of idea. We've always wanted to do that type of idea for each game, even though the the kind of the 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 narrative framing of it is totally different, um, and the actual like mechanics of it are totally different per game. But that broad idea, there's an in-world difficulty system that's been in each of our games. Yeah, and something that I think we're really seeing a lot more in roguelike design, in particular. Um, I don't know if you played Slay the Spire that came out oh, yeah. last year, and their whole ascension mode that each yeah. time you play it, it gets harder in a unique way. 
And I really do like that idea because I think it really lends itself well to roguelike games. That yeah. it's not just making it harder; it's making it different. It's forcing you to That's adapt right. more with each play. That's right, and and it's it's good. So Ascension Mode in Slay the Spire is actually like a very uh, is a direct and specific influence on on our system in Hades. In addition to our past work, like we, yeah. I I loved um, I loved their uh, Ascension Mode um, yeah. because, like you said, it 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 just it provided um, it provided like structured challenges. It's like okay, you did this. Now try this. Can you reach a little bit farther? Yeah. You, you know, can you go a little bit farther? And it didn't just do it by, you know, yeah, giving the enemies more hit points or something, right? It's just like mm -hmm. you had to think about it differently. So we really, yeah. that part of it was really really cool, and we tried to, we wanted to have like a similar feel in Hades, where like for the end game to have like a structured end game where where you know the part where it's more kind of our style is that you still elect kind of in which ways it's going to get harder yeah but but by how much you know you you could choose that like you don't have to just you know you're like well okay i guess i'll weigh enemies having a little more health against you know being a little bit faster doing a little more damage but over time you start to mix and match those elements or like you you can you know if you if you fail to succeed um, at a certain kind of difficulty threshold, you could still choose like different difficulty modifiers. So you're like, oh, you know, I got wrecked by the enemies being faster, so I'm going to turn that off, but I'll turn this other thing on. Um, we, we found that really compelling kind of in our own playthroughs, and it's it's been a really well-received system so far. And, yeah. So, and we're, yeah, we're great. For, like, it was amazing in Slay the Spire as well. Yeah, and I think the persistent elements of Hades really do stand really well with the design of it. And the idea, as you said, that you're always moving forward yeah. in terms of whether you're getting resources, you're unlocking the uh, weapon variants for the various arms. Yeah. And it's a very tough balance to achieve. And I have to ask this, like, for you and the rest of the team of Super Giant, like, have any of you, like, worked on, like, roguelike design before going to Hades? We we have uh, for for sure. Uh, uh, Alice Lai, uh, our technical designer, mm -hmm. uh, she's worked on roguelike games oh. uh, for sure. But most of us uh, have not. Um, uh, Amir Rao, uh, who's uh, our our studio director, and I mentioned one of my colleagues from back in the EA days. He does. He's he's a guy who like changes the numbers in the game. He does like the. He's very hands on. Uh, with the balance of, of all our games, so it's um, and it's like a, it, it's a type of work he really really loves, and it's and it's also just a huge kind of never ending, yeah. a challenge. Oh, also, yes. like we've never gone a single update uh, without balance changes, but it's something we take like like he takes it and we as a team take it super super seriously. Um, like in all, even though we've made these single, they're not like esports games or whatever. Um, you know, if Bastion has like a balance issue, someone might say like, "Well, who cares? Like, it yeah. doesn't affect anybody." But we still, we we've always, I I would say we've always taken it really seriously. I think mm -hmm. that that's probably back to our uh, command and conquer roots. I mentioned <laughs> at the beginning of the call. Yeah. We've, we've valued trying to get that balance just right so that for the player, it's it's very they have the most interesting choices available and they feel like they're constantly running into kind of new viable. Uh, mm -hmm. Options uh, to play with, and that's that's kind of that's the goal of balance. I think it's it, it, the goal of balance isn't for everything to be equally as strong. It's just like to create as many, or it depends on the game. But you, yeah. you want to our our mindset around balance is to create as many sort of interesting viable options as possible. Because um, if something if we spend a lot of time on a weapon and it just like and it sucks, you know, it's weak. Like mm -hmm. then it's a waste. It's a waste of time. Yeah. Um, it, it has to be viable. Like a player has to use that tool and be like, I could see a situation where this would be helpful, or or yeah. feel like, oh man, this really fits my play style. So we're we're just always looking for opportunities to to kind of bring bring everything up so that it mm -hmm. it it can it can feel good to someone in the right at the right place at the right time. Yeah, and that is actually the perfect segue into the question I wanted to ask you. And then we have one final question from chat, and then we'll do kind of like our final wrap up. Then, because again, good. I know th these casts like I always say, like 
we always go long because there's always so much we're going <laughs> to talk about. But I definitely wanted to touch on the balance and the design philosophy of the various skills and stuff in Hades. And you kind of started that with what you were just saying. And this, I think, is another very interesting aspect of not only of roguelike design, but especially of Hades, is that idea that it's not about creating, you know, I want to make the perfect sword combination. I want to create the perfect use of the shield. Because you can never really do that reliably in a roguelike design. Yeah. And what I wanted to ask you was, what is kind of like, I guess, like your philosophy when it comes to balancing the various uh, god buffs with the various weapons? Because like we said, like you can't reliably say, I'm going to take this shield and get these buffs, and I will play the game this way. There's always that level of adaptation or pivoting, I like to say, that has yeah. to occur in a good roguelike. Yeah, so I um, th this is certainly gonna uh, Amir Amira's best fit to to speak to it directly, though working with him closely, I I I, I will I will paraphrase as best I can. Mm -hmm. Though it, it's really like I uh, it's really like I said that it's about um, presenting players with the most like interesting, like powerful feeling options and opportunities as as possible. So you know, in in Hades, you're often presented with choices um, when when you meet gods. Uh, uh, present you with one of three, you know, different boons uh, or, or blessings, right? Mm -hmm. And it's important that you look at that list, and it isn't always like a no-brainer what to do there. You should you should get it. You should find yourself in situations where, man, I could go this way or I could go that way. And we have like a rare, mm -hmm. for example, we have like a rarity system in the game, and that helps yep. um, complicate some of the decisions. <laughs> like maybe there's a blessing that normally it's like oh man this this isn't a good fit for you but it has like but you got you know whatever epic rarity on it and you're like huh mm -hmm. that you know normally i wouldn't pick that but it's so good right now that you know what i'm just going to try it and and it'll compel you to try it and maybe you'll like it maybe it'll be better than you expect um and then the next time you see it you know maybe you'll pick it again and so on so we want to um and then broadly to your other point like Roguelikes, you know, they're they're fundamentally kind of like a battle between you and the randomness, right? You're trying to like, as a player, you want to like eliminate the randomness. You want to just <laughs> make have everything go your way perfectly. But of course, if if you were to actually be able to do that, it wouldn't be a very interesting game anymore. Um, but fighting and controlling the randomness is like super compelling in games when 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 the game like kind of elegantly provides ways for you to manage that. So we, it's like a really, uh, I think like um, a delicate process, I would say. The balance is, is, is quite intricate in this game since there are so many overlapping systems. But we made some pretty big, like for us, they were, they, they felt like scary decisions early on. Like for example, we're like, you know what? You, you just take whatever weapon you want, like every time, if you, if you just like, Whereas in, in a lot of roguelikes, they would never do that. They, like, randomize your tools uh, fun uh, as, like, a fundamental uh, aspect of their design. But for us, it's like, you know what? If you like the shield and you just want to play with the shield, go for it. Um, that will have other things to mix things up on you than that choice. It, because if things are too random and you can't, like, do anything to yeah. control the randomness, that feels bad also. And then it just feels yeah. like a like a slot machine and you just have no control over it at all. So hitting that sweet spot where you're just kind of on the edge of being able to control it, mm -hmm. um, that to us that feels really like compelling and so we try to we try to find that and that's a yeah, that's a tricky balance to strike in an ongoing sort of thing that that we pursue as we add more systems or add more content to existing systems and so on. Yeah. And again, like I could we could spend I'm resisting to like get an old conversation about pivoting and choices in roguelike design, but it is such a fascinating aspect of it. And um, here is the final uh, question from chat, and then we'll get into kind of like our we'll begin to wrap things up. And yeah, like I, I, I keep it. saying, like if you're free in the future, uh, definitely uh, I'm more than happy to you know talk uh, roguelike design with you for until the cows come home. But uh, final question from chat. Brian asked, "What techniques do you use to foster efficiency in design and development?" Oh, um, we, you know, 
that's a, that's a really good question. Um, our our production mindset, I guess, is around. Um, we've always been very tactical as a team. Like we, every every sort of everything that we do has to be described in a in a basic way in terms of our internal production. We don't have like complicated task tracking. A given task uh, typically is just a sentence or two, and should be achievable in many cases in you know a couple of hours or you know the same day. We don't pursue tasks that are like totally. We try not to pursue tasks that are like totally open ended and have like ungated requirements and time. So reducing our work to like its sort of atomic parts um, is really helpful for efficiency because it means that it it like just doing work it feels good to like make just like in games it feels good to make progress to be able to say like I did this check this off a list this small thing okay I I. I tuned this one weapon, or I like wrote this one scene, or something like that. Um, and then, when when the tasks are specific and are like small enough, you can get through a lot of them quickly. And suddenly, you have momentum. Suddenly, you're like building something, and you can look at the result, and you're like, "Whoa, this, something is actually coming together here." So, um, I think just like being being clear and specific about the way we structure tasks is an important part of our efficiency and then just being really honest with the um individual like with ourselves uh about what we what we can do in the amount of time that we have that's really important as well like they they don't we just let time often be the constraint on things especially in a game like this where you know for example we have like cosmetic items that you could buy for the house of hades and we can make a million of those items, and mm -hmm. but we, we're not going to make a million of them, I don't think, at least not yet. <laughs> so what? So how many? What's the right number? We have to. There has to be some sort of cutoff, and sometimes we just give ourselves a certain amount of time. We're like, we're going to do the best we can within this time we've given ourselves, and maybe we'll come up with ten things. Maybe we'll come up with two, but we're going to move on to the next thing after that, and, and not get like sort of uh, stuck in a rut with this one particular task. Because we got a we got a lot of other stuff we have to do. I just hope those words don't come back to haunt you. I have to use that with that. a million with a million cosmetic. No, yeah. I mean it would be uh, pardon. It would be great if I uh, if one day we got to that number. But we uh, yeah, I can I can I can assuredly say we will not have that number uh, in the in the near term. Uh, but we'll have quite a few though. All right. I don't know. All right, I, and since we did go over our time, I believe it's time to begin to wrap things up. Again, there's so much we can talk about. So uh, to end this cast on, so with Hades, for the people watching, what do, you, what do you and the rest of Supergiant have planned in the coming months in terms of, I guess, like what else is left that's kind of like on yeah. your plate? Yeah, so we're, we're getting pretty close, uh, relatively speaking. The game structure is has been there since the end of last year, um, and we're in the midst of um, really just kind of like polishing and fleshing out existing systems. And um, from a narrative standpoint, the really big thing left to do is the ending of the game. We've always said we're going to kind of withhold the the real ending of the game until we exit early access. So we've been actively working on aspects of that ending from the start of this year. We just, uh, we care a lot about the endings of our games. And we, while there's no guarantee of how things turn out, our only way of ensuring that our endings are, you know, in any way, or the best tool we have to like sort of be best ensure our endings are worthwhile is to just put a lot of time into them. So we've been putting in that time um, and um, and then we also have a big uh, technical undertaking right now that's going to optimize our engine, uh, our, optimize our tech quite a bit, make it so that uh, the game is more performant on lower end systems, and make it so that it's easier for us uh, to bring the game uh, to additional platforms in the future. So we have that big tech undertaking that's underway, um, and and then just like a bunch of content stuff to start to wrap up. And then hopefully we'll, with any luck, we'll exit early access uh, sometime uh, later this year. We don't know when exactly. All right. Do you see any like post-release support plan for Hades, or is it still too up in the air right now? 
Yeah, that's a good question. It's certainly, um, it, it is, uh, it's not anything we, um, we're, we're ready, we're ready to talk about, but it's certainly something that we're, we're thinking about. Um, it's, it's kind of like, it's definitely wait and see on some level of like how, how, um, are things going to go with our next update and, and beyond. Um, but, but it's something we, um, um, we're certainly interested in, in exploring like what, um, what happens to this? We we have that question ourselves. Uh, folks ask us like, what happens after launch? Our goal right now is to make sure we launch uh, really strong, and we have to sort of keep our eye on the ball. In the we have to make sure that stuff we're doing in the short run is as good as possible before we think uh, too much about the long term. All right. And as a quick tangent, is that Viva Pinata in the back? When I see a game <laughs> box, that looks very familiar to me. <laughs> as a matter of fact. I One of my favorites. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I I still have an old uh, my son. I still have an old uh, Xbox 360 just sitting around up here, and <laughs> my son will sometimes bust some of this stuff out. Um, oh. Yeah, and Viva Pinata came up. Yeah, great. Yeah, it's an amazing game. Actually. I wish I would get brought to the PC, but that is a topic set to for, <laughs> for another, another time. time. Yeah. <laughs> so my final question for you then, Greg, is: you have anything you'd like to say to the fans to end this cast on? Yeah, we, we, we just really, uh, we really, really appreciate the support uh, above and beyond uh, anything. That is, that is the main and immediate thing that comes to mind. Um, when, when you're a developer kind of plugging away on a game and your audience is excited about what you're doing and believes in you and, and is like offering constructive feedback about and, and just kind of like talking about their experience and is excited about where it's going to go, oh man, that means so much. Um, it really means a lot. And I, like for me personally, um, it's, you know, I, my own goal with working on games is, is for, is to make games that could leave a lasting and positive impression on people. So like the response to our games means, means the world to me. And, and I don't, I, I, I never assume it's, it's nice to never assume anything about the kind of response you get because then when people say nice things from time to time, it feels really good instead of like taking for granted or whatever. I don't know that any, I don't think any developer takes for granted that people are going to like what they're working on. Um, so it feels, it feels really good when, when you hear uh, from players about what's working well. And also when they're critical about it, that's really important too. That's the, the, the compliments feel good but but the constructive criticism that's the stuff where you're like okay i know you you've helped me to like Chris, a problem has like crystallized for me and now i was i was kind of worried about this and now i know it's a real problem and you know what i just like i just thought about a solution that i hadn't thought about before and th those are great moments too and that's just comes from people being engaged with the game talking about it so yeah we're we're just really grateful to like have a player like our games haven't really we haven't had a player community in the past because again like we just work on a game mm -hmm. in silence and then put it out there um, a player community in the more traditional sense but now we have like a, a, an active player base and it's been really really cool just like hearing their thoughts over time yeah so thank you again and like I said I've been enjoying Hades myself I've been enjoying your games since Bastion so definitely thank congratulations you, with the success and again with what the future holds with finishing up Hades thank you no Thanks problem a lot. so uh, do you have any social media you'd like to plug before I do my uh, end of stream speech oh sure I, I'm just I'm just uh, Kasavin on Twitter it's my last name K-A-S-A-V-I-N um, and we're Supergiant Games on Twitter and everywhere else um, that's that's always. I, I actually, uh, in addition to the other stuff I mentioned, I I run our Twitter myself. Um, so yeah, we're wearing different hats and whatnot. So yeah, come let us know what you think anytime, and it's it's fun to fun to chat on there. All right. So with that, for the people watching this live record, we're going to end things for our cast. As always, if you'd like to follow me, I am on Twitter at GWBicer. We have our Discord and Patreon link down below. Discord is open to everybody. Patreon supporters get early and ad-free access to our design talks. And if you are working on an upcoming game or want to talk design with me, we're always looking for a guest for future casts. But, Greg, again, it has been a pleasure hanging out with you this evening. Definitely stay safe, and best of luck with finishing up with Hades. 
Thank you very much. All right. So for everyone watching, thanks for tuning in. We will be back later for our regular game streaming and come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where some of the art and science of games. Have a great evening, everybody, and I will talk to you next time.